welcome to Making It Last, where we share ideas to help families tackle major issues. I'm your host, Regina DeMeo, and I have done my best to avoid talking about divorce in the uh, six months that we've been airing shows. But finally, today is the day where I am going to talk about the dark side. And to help me talk about the dark side, I have Marjorie DeLima, who's managing partner at Fate Weiss and DeLima. She's been helping families for almost 20 years now dealing with divorce. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, uh, in the 14 years I've been doing this, the last seven I've tried to steer away from litigation, which I think makes a lot of sense uh, just from an economic standpoint. But do you still see a lot of people going to court? Um, yes, well, I still see a lot of cases being filed, and um, many of those actually resolve, but sometimes they resolve right at the point of trial. You're on the, what they call the courthouse steps. Right. Um, but yeah, there are some cases that make it to litigation and um, as you probably remember when you <laughs> back up when you were on the dark side um, divorce you know there's different phases and there could be many different right. hearings or litigation there and so you may have one small hearing and you kind of build on that and then from there you might resolve the case but yeah people are still litigating definitely what do you think is the thing that people litigate the most? Because to me it seems like child support, it's a formula, people, right? Like, let's just plug in the numbers and see what it is. Uh, alimony, we have certain guidelines that we can refer to also. Uh, and then property division, it shouldn't be that hard to figure out what you acquired during the marriage and how to equitably divide that. Custody, to me, is the one that I think would be the, the trickiest. What, what do you think? Well... It's funny because a lot of times divorces are more, are more emotional, so it's not just the issues. And there may be, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of distrust. Um, and the, you know, the formulas that we have and the guidelines that we have to rely upon aren't as clear cut as we would hope. And um, like, for example, the child support, yes, there's guidelines. But if you're dealing with one spouse who has um, their own business, then their right. income isn't as easily ascertainable. You may have expenses for the child that one sh party doesn't want to pay yeah. that you want to include. Um, there are also the guidelines technically only go up to a certain amount and after that it's discretionary. So you can impute some, or I'm sorry not impute, but um, allocate some expenses for the children or you can extrapolate the guidelines and then again it's who's your judge and how they look at the case, and who's right. your opposing counsel. I mean, there's a lot of different factors that determine or um, affect the outcome, that it's not as clear cut. And alimony is another example. We've been trying to get a um, formula passed through the legislature that's used like child support guidelines, and it won't pass. Mm -hmm. and, got, and so alimony, if you look at case law, is all over the place. Right. And it is a crapshoot. And there are all the cases you can't, there's not, it's not easy to rely on any of them. And it does depend on your judge. And there's one judge I might get, I'll know that judge does not like to award alimony, or I'll be assigned another judge, and I'll know that judge is a little more favorable to alimony. So it's really, and is a crapshoot, and there's so many factors that go right. into it. Um, it goes beyond what you need. It goes beyond... Um, what, what the parties make, it goes beyond that sometimes. And um, it's, uh, I just lost my train of thought with the, with the alimony, um, but it is, it is just a crapshoot. I mean, it's so, to determine what's the amount going to be and, and the, the duration. duration. Right? Exactly. And the part that I find people, eventually they are able to find a number that works, but it's the duration. Right. Like someone who's been, you know, um, at home for the last 20 years, Probably That's a little lifetime. easier. That's a little easier. It's right. the ones in the middle, the ones that yeah. have been 10 years or 12 years, or I wanted my wife to work after the kids started high school and she wouldn't go to work, or, or sometimes it's I wanted my husband to go back to work, or right. someone's unemployed. So the ones that are 20 years or more are almost a little more clear cut than the ones in the middle. And what we're seeing is a lot of ones that are in the middle, but we're also seeing. 70 and 80 year olds getting divorced. Yeah. Which is kind of sad. It's hard, it's, yeah. Um, but so. But you think maybe alimony will cease to be an issue now that you have more uh, more people that have, they're both working and less of that traditional marriage where one is working and one's at home. I think you know, it's going to fade out. 
Um, not necessarily. What we see a lot of times is uh, not the, not an equality of income or not an equality of lifestyles once the parties separate. Okay. And uh, one of the factors with alimony, um, when you're looking at maybe more permanent alimony or the duration, is a disparity or an unconscionable disparity of lifestyle. And people seem to interpret that as an unconscionable disparity of incomes right. when the superior earning spouse may be very frugal living in a one-bedroom apartment and that spouse's major complaint is that the other spouse is a spend thrift and spending 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 and so whose lifestyle are you comparing to type thing so it's different than it was uh, but the laws have changed as well right so it used to be if you had at fault you couldn't get alimony I believe before my time I mean, I that think was that's yeah. in Virginia. <laughs> um, I don't know about Virginia, but in Maryland, it really it's not it's a factor to consider. Right. But I have seen more times than not, it's not a big factor unless it was a big fault, a big huge, you know, event or situation. So. Right. I mean, I think fault comes, especially adultery, more into play with the property division because if somebody has spent a lot of funds. Uh, with their extramarital affair as opposed to funds that right. should have been used for the family, they're going to get probably right. dinged in the property division. Right. And that's what we call dissipation, right. when it's not going to family purposes. And we try to look back and trace how much was dissipated and claim the, that spouse's share of that, which mm -hmm. is it's an onerous task if you can do it. Well, that's when you get forensic accountants involved, right? You can. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's expensive. It's hard, though, to follow cash. Yeah. If some of it's got. So it just depends. And it is expensive. Experts, in any case, are very expensive. You not only have to pay them for your, their time in investigating the case or whatever their job is during the case, but you pay them to testify as well if they are called to testify. Right. So it does get rather expensive. Yeah, I mean, I've always been shocked um, by people's reaction. What do you mean I have to pay this person a $5,000 retainer? It's like, well, do you think they're just going to do this work <laughs> right. you know, right. for free? And Absolutely. Then, no, <laughs> they need right. a retainer up front. And so, you know, when you're getting a vocational expert to prove that somebody can earn a certain income or when you're getting a forensic accountant, they all want their retainer. Yep, absolutely. Which brings me to a point that, like, maybe you could explain for people how we're supposed to build because I don't, I don't think everybody understands that at all. How we're supposed to bill is, especially in family law, which is a little different from other, other areas of the right. law, is we, don't, we cannot do a contingency basis on how much property is, is obtained or how much alimony you receive. It is on an hourly basis, and 99.9% um, .9 of a law firms and or attorneys will request or demand a retainer up front which the retainer is usually, let's say it's $5,000, which in our firm that's kind of low. So that means there's right. not a lot of issues. So the 5000 goes into our trust account. And then as we work, we are keeping track of our hours. Right. And, and most firms have like time matters or time slips or some sort of electronic computerized way that they do that. Or they write it down and someone enters it for them. Right. And at any time in the month, I can, as managing partner, go in and see how much we've billed, mm -hmm. even before the bills are done. Right. We do our bills once a month for our clients. So at any, in the middle of the month, let's say, I can go in and see that we've billed billable hours of 10 hours to this client. I can take the money then and move it to operating. Right. The client gets a bill every month. And it should show, and our bill show, exactly what was done. An itemized statement. An itemized statement. Exactly what's in escrow, exactly what was pulled out, and exactly what's left or what you owe now. And what we do in our retainer agreements is say we may need to ask for an additional retainer at, a, at some point. Right. Um, and if that's not possible, we may not be able to continue. Right, because and people have a hard time with that. And we do too, because yeah. we don't want to drop the case. But we can't, we can't not, I, for example, I'm a managing partner of a firm, so I have two partners and three associates, and I have three work, um, admin staff. I need to pay everyone. <laughs> right. And pay my rent. And pay, you know, and right. so we are working. Um, and we all need to get paid, just like someone who goes into a job that gets a wage, and works right. two weeks, gets a paycheck, works another two weeks, gets a paycheck. It's the same t 
type thing. So it's difficult. And the family law is very emotional. So we, there's many cases we get emotionally attached to. Yeah. You know? No, but sometimes I do feel like a taxi cab driver. Yeah. Basically, the meter is running, and you run out of funds. Right. I'm so sorry. Yeah, you're here. We're off in Harlem. <laughs> Get out. I mean, yeah. it's horrible. I know. But, I mean, unfortunately, you're right. We right. have our own set of bills to pay, and, you know, this is not pro bono work. We all do have our pro bono right. cases that we do. And we do. Yeah. We also, sometimes when there's, uh, there's a lot of assets to be divided, at the end, whether it's in resolution or not, our clients will pay us through that once it's divided, especially the spouse that doesn't really have access to funds. Or many families we see nowadays don't have liquid right. cash to pay. It's tied up in an asset that will either be sold or divided in some way. Right, like they may get someone's retirement and then right. they're going to have to take a one-time hardship and right. cash. Well, some of those retirements, too, you can um, take out without penalty. It depends on what it right. is. So, um, or the house gets sold, or you get your, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So. so, it seems like uh, we've covered alimony, child support, and uh, property division, right? So, we've, we've sort of left off custody. That one, to me, seems like hardest. the most emotional. It, 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 well, money can be very emotional. It really? can be, oh, absolutely, because people are afraid. And when you have financial well, problems, it's very point. scary, especially since the economy took a dive. And I mean, it's very scary. However, the custody with money and property issues, it's document intensive more so. Okay. With custody, nine times out of ten, there's not a lot of document. It's no. very um, perception oriented witness oriented, testimony oriented, you know, it's very right. emotional. Um, what we find is many people doing their best, but they can't separate what's best for the kids and what they think is mm -hmm. their best interest. It's just natural as the parent. It's really hard to do. Um, dad, who was never really a dad because he came home and went, oh, and he's tired from all day, now wants to be all involved. And mom's and that's like, okay. well, it is, but mom's like, oh, great, now you want to be involved. It's like never was it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it is very difficult. And uh, supporting two households is a lot more expensive than one. And if you have more than one child, housing them in the other house, even for overnights, can become problematic just because of the size of your place. If right. you want more time, you have to accommodate that. And for the kids, I think the kids are. They're resilient, but it's hard to go back and forth. It's just hard. Well, especially the older they are, right? Mm -hmm. Like my son was only 18 months when we split up. And so all this child has known for the last eight something right. years is that, yeah, right. he goes back and forth. It's, it's all he knows. Right. But if obviously like an eight-year-old or nine-year-old has a very different you know, set of memories with one house and you know, sleeping in just one bed. Right. So that is going to be yeah. you know, more difficult. So, and then custody cases can bring in cust uh, psychological evaluations of the parents and the children. They can bring in custody evaluations, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a whole slew of experts on that end, which is very expensive as well. And um, it, that too is a crapshoot to a certain extent. So it's um, who is the primary caretaker, but now dad really wants to get involved and what's best for the child and how close they live to school. and. Um, what their activities are, and we find that the parent doesn't have as much time, gets upset when they have to take them to these activities, and it's right. just, it's really, yeah, difficult, difficult. Well, we're going to take a little bit of a short break, okay? and then we will be right back. Oh, this isn't good. <laughs> I was a gift from him to her. I'm going to the animal shelter, which isn't necessarily bad, I just... I hate the stigma associated with shelter pets. People will think I bite or that I spray everywhere. They're the ones with problems. <laughs> I'm totally fine. Adopt me. You'll see. I'm going to go pack. Welcome back to Making It Last, where we're talking about uh, divorces, something I've tried to avoid for a very long time in this series. And uh, with me today is Marjorie DeLima, who is a managing partner at DeLima Weiss, I'm sorry. Fate Weiss and DeLima. Fate Weiss and DeLima. Thanks so much for being here, Marjorie. Thanks for having me. So we've been talking about custody, and um, 
there's one thing I've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed, but I think a lot of people move to D.C. They're not originally from D.C. And so they don't have a lot of family members to help them with uh, the raising of the children. I think that causes a lot of stress for families. Have you seen that? Um, it can, yes. I've seen, you know what I've seen now that you bring that up? I've had a couple clients just recently, it seems, and I don't know what it is about North Carolina, but moved to North Carolina because they had family there and they're split up from their spouses and they're the primary parent and they need the support. So, um, and they felt like there was nothing here anymore with the That's what I wanted to get to. Right, yeah. splitting from their spouse and their spouse's family then isn't so supportive of them. Right. They want to see the kids, but it's usually with the other spouse. So, yeah, and it's so funny that it's just ironic. It's just happened recently. I have two cases that relocating to North Carolina. North Carolina must be the family state. I think people don't realize that relocation, relocation cases are actually hard. They are win. very hard. Very hard. And, like, maybe you could explain why that is. Like, wh whose burden is it to prove that it's okay to move? The person moving. Yeah. It's their burden. Um, and it depends on where you are in the case. There's initial custody determinations, which is the initial, if you're litigating, it's the initial custody that the court hears. And right. that is almost, might be easier but not easy mm -hmm. to get your relocation than a modification once you have a custody order in place because at that point you've shown material change in circumstances right. and you are showing that moving is a material change but why are you taking the kids because you can move you can leave the children with the other spouse and it depends on what kind of access the other spouse has it depends on how much they're involved if it's a 50 50 you're not gonna do right. it. If it's an every other weekend and then canceling some weekends, you're probably going to be able to do it. It just really depends on a lot of different factors. It depends on why you're moving. It depends on if you had a job there, if you have a job here, what your, what your, what support system you have there as compared to here. Um, so, but they are much more difficult. And really, the kids then are separated even further from the other parent, uh, which is harder because when you're in the same area, at least there's that opportunity to maybe visit more even if it doesn't happen but there is that opportunity where if you're six seven eight hours away right. it's not as easy so yeah I mean one of the worst cases I had uh, I think it was like five years ago is this woman from the Midwest who moved here to be with her husband who she met on the internet right <laughs> and then uh, things fell apart but now they had two little ones and she had no family mm -hmm. no job and oh yeah he stopped paying the mortgage so the house was in foreclosure oh, no. so guess what she had nowhere else to go other than moving back home to the Midwest. Right. And we took the case to trial, and I actually won the right for her to move back to be with her family right. and the kids. But it's sad because that's, I mean, I think those are the ones that go to trial. Because when you have that black and white situation where you, there is no mediation, there is no way to compromise in the middle, those are the ones that I, I think are the ones that go right. the, full, you know, the full distance. That's true. There's also... Uh, there are cases that I thought there's no way we're going to settle it because it's so black and white. Uh -huh. I had a case where mom and daughter, mom was remarried with new children and okay. daughter of my client, dad, and her mom's new husband's Irish from Ireland and we're moving to Ireland. And dad's like, no who? <laughs> <laughs> and so we went to mediation first. And there, we were so polar opposites. Right. And we ended up settling it. Wow. Um, so it's not impossible. I never say it's impossible to settle. It's just I don't always have the high hopes in some cases. Right. Um, but it did settle. And but really only 10% go to trial, yes. in my experience, yes. right? Yes, that's true. It's just that you tend to have to file more, whereas I try to do more of the work before anything gets filed. That's true. Okay. We do file more. We file almost first. I mean, actually... I'm trained in collaborative law and I'm trained as a mediator, so I will suggest and talk about other processes. Right. Um, but if it comes down to litigation, it depends on the case, but more times than not, we'll file first. It's usually at that posture. Right. And the, because the court puts you on a track. And it's a long track. It's a long <laughs> track, and you, the court also orders you to different mediation. At, and at parenting a, classes. And parenting classes, so that you have opportunities to settle. And sometimes... The clients or the parties have to get a taste, and they get it at a pendente liti hearing, which is that real 
the kind initial of hearing. Initial quick hearing about, you know, very um, meantime, in the meantime, give me support. In the meantime, I need access. Very limited issues. And a lot of times after that, they're like, that just was not fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it was expensive. Yeah. Uh, so they look towards settling at that point. So. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Unfortunately, some people have to go through that initial hearing mm -hmm. to get that experience, right? Because I... I've noticed, it's, I don't know, I'm sure you have too. There's some people that are, are great when they're in my office, and I think they're going to be a, a fantastic witness. And then when they go to the actual witness stand, they become like this paralyzed deer, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> deer like hit by the, yeah. these lights, and it's like, wh what happened to you? And meanwhile, this person that they portrayed as like, a total jerk, you're going to see right through him, he comes across as like Mr. Swab. Right. And, and the trial's a show to a certain extent. <laughs> And I tell people, I encourage settlement all the time. And I tell people, you're going to have one person, that judge, determine everything that's dear to you after only seeing a snapshot of you, who you are in your life. And you are not going to necessarily be portrayed as your best. Right. So if that's what you're... And we settle cases um, also not always because of the monetary, the cost, but also because of the risk. Like this yeah. is what you risk. And I guess that's monetary, but you risk losing little Johnny. You risk doing, you know, this is your risk going to trial, your worst case scenario. Right. And um, sometimes we can get settlements that way when we're ameliorating the risk on both sides. Right. Well, in mediation, you're trained, what's your best alternative, mm -hmm. right, to a negotiated agreement? What's your worst alternative? Right. And then somewhere in the middle. Right. That's exactly. where people will, will settle. Exactly. So, but if they don't, I mean, I often find that something like a custody evaluator is really good at kind of being a reality check for people. Like Sometimes. Yeah. So, um, I don't know that everybody even understands what a custody evaluation is. Well, custody evaluator is a quote-unquote expert, but that could be anyone from a social worker to a psychiatrist. Right. So, there's a whole spectrum of expertise involved that um, interviews the parties, interviews third parties, uh, third persons that the parties will name, I guess. Right. Um, possibly some teachers, if there's therapists involved, and the children. And make a home visit mm -hmm. and um, come up with recommendations at that point. Now, there's free custody evaluators offered through Montgomery County Courts. Right. And I tend to shy away from those because they are, <laughs> I know I've said the word crapshoot a lot, but they are. And there's a couple that are very good. There are a couple that are really bad. And I know a couple of them, are, all of them are social workers, and a couple of them, as soon as they finished school, got a job there. Mm -hmm. Here I am pounding on the table. Um, and their time that they have to spend is very, very small. Well, they're swamped. They're swamped. <laughs> you know, you get what you pay for, like you said, um, and basically they meet with each party and the child maybe a total of an hour or two. Right. And then pass these recommendations where a custody evaluator who's private, the one that you pay for, who's probably going to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist, right. will actually do intense testing for psychological evaluations mm -hmm. of the parties and the kids and talk to third persons and we'll spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and do home visits and do more than one right um to but really those are like sixteen thousand and up they can be yeah. yes absolutely um and some people have that kind of money right i believe that custody evaluations really should be for cases where there may be some sort of abuse um, out alleged or right. um, alcohol and drug abuse mm -hmm. alleged or domestic violence um, or some sort of mental illness alleged. Otherwise, I don't think they're, right. <laughs> they're very useful. And what we find in the courts are people just, I want a custody evaluation, I want a custody evaluation. And <laughs> you can get stuck with it and you get stuck with this really bad evaluation because they're just they're just not that great and they don't spend as much time because they don't have the time and they're right. not trained as well um, so I'm not a big proponent unless there's a reason right but there's a very good reason like mental illness 
domestic violence, abuse of alcohol, or you know that kind of thing where you really want to get in and see what's going on. That's different, I believe, than the normal stereotypical breakup family. Who's the better parent, or how should we split this up? Or I just think it's a it's a waste of time, actually, and money. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and that's why, I mean, those are not the cases I usually deal with. I think the, with severe mental illness or when there is domestic violence, right. they're not usually going to collaborative remediation. No. Those are usually right, right. screened out. Right. Um, so those are the high-conflict cases that have to go to court and will require a lot right. of resources. Right. right. Um, so, I mean, in your experience, what is an average person who's going to litigate wind up spending? Oh, oh, I'm sorry to laugh, but well, it's, again, it's hard to say because I get that question all the time in yeah. initial consults, and it's really hard to say, but I will give you some examples if I can. First of all, it depends if there's minor children and if that's at issue. And what also can be at issue, other than just physical custody, is legal custody. Mm -hmm. And that is a hot spot for most people, and that is who gets to make decisions on behalf of the children on major legal issues. Right. And um, that, if a lot of times, th that's a real um, hits the wall <laughs> as far as negotiations. But let's assume you have the meantime, in the meantime, pendente liti issues, like access and support. And let's assume you have custody. And let's assume then you have merits, which is the property and the alimony and the, all that. Right. So what you're looking at is... Um, that kind of fully litigated case could run 50 to 100 grand per person. Yeah. Now, I've seen law firms charge much more than that. Didn't you just have one? <laughs> I <laughs> did. <laughs> and that was only for custody. These people were never married that right. we were talking about earlier. Um, because it also depends on who the other attorney is. Yeah. Um, if you and I had a case, we would try our best to get it settled right. and if we had to litigate we would litigate but it would be more friendlier um, as civil is a better word and we wouldn't rack it up like right. churn it it's called I do not churn cases my firm doesn't churn cases no. there are some people that do yep. um, and so it depends on who the attorney is right. um, and <coughs> excuse me and it depends on how reasonable or unreasonable your own client is and the other party <laughs> So, um, so people need to do their homework when they're yeah, hiring. <laughs> definitely, but yeah. I have I don't have a problem telling people they're not being reasonable, and yeah. I there are there are it's happened very rarely, but I've had to part ways, yeah. and it, it usually was with a custody case, right? That it was so unreasonable that I could not bring myself to present that case right. and that what my client wanted, um, and that was years and years ago. Otherwise, but I. You know, and I, I have a saying, it's, um, do you want to put my kid through college or yours? Right. Because i rather get 10 cases and settle them and make a nice income and keep my firm going than have one big case. Right. And, um, you know, these litigated cases also take a toll emotionally. Yeah. Um, as, as you know, with collaborative law and mediation, I mean, some of the goal is to keep these people at least... Um, civil to each other throughout right. the lives of their kids. Right. And after a litigated, bitter case, you're not going to do that. You can't do that. I mean, it's just it's just terrible for the kids. Right. Um, We're going to have to stop. Because, okay. But um, if someone wanted to contact you, how could they reach you for more information? Um, Fate Wise and Delima. We have a website that's www.fate. F is in Frank. A I T W I S. E D I L I M A dot com. Our phone number is three zero one two five one zero one hundred. And feel free to ask for me, Marjorie DeLima. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week on Making It Last.